This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, About that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected time. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. So Jesus' words this morning are, um, let's just say, a little ominous, aren't they? He warns his disciples of storm clouds on the horizon and says that the Son of Man will come at an unexpected hour like a thief in the night. Don't get too caught up in the revelry of your lives, Jesus says to them, for the end times may be near. Some will survive, some may not. Stay awake. Be on alert. Let's be honest. Such apocalyptic language is hard to get our heads around and certainly is a jarring beginning to the season of Advent. Fresh off a relaxing Thanksgiving break, what we are longing for is a gentle and easy transition into the quiet time of Advent, and instead we're confronted by a downright frightening Jesus, who sounds like one of those unhinged street corner preachers of doom and gloom, haranguing passers-by with predictions of the final judgment. What on earth is going on? Well, we need a little context to make sense of all this. We are near the end of Matthew's gospel, not at the beginning. And whether we like it or not, Advent always starts this way, with words of warning rather than words of comfort. In the chapters leading up to today's gospel passage, Matthew's Jesus has been preparing his disciples for his last week on earth and his journey to the cross. Jesus knows of the violence that awaits him and that he will not be with his friends much longer. And so he tries to brace them for the dark days that lie ahead, which is why his words are so chilling. It is no surprise, then, that the disciples come to Jesus alarmed by his message, wanting to know what to expect. Tell us when the end will be, they plead with Jesus. What will be the signs? They are a depleted, anxious, worried lot who have good reason to wonder what the future will hold. And what is it that Jesus tells them exactly? He says, rather surprisingly, that he does not know precisely when the end will come, when God will step in to clean up the mess we have made. Only the Father knows this, Jesus says. But that God will appear, this much Jesus knows. So our task, Jesus urges his followers, is to be ready to prepare ourselves, to pay attention, and to wait for the coming of the Lord. Waiting, 
That is the watchword for Advent. Most of us, though, are bad at waiting, let's confess, much less waiting attentively. We moderns are used to getting what we want, and we like to get what we want when we want it. We have become a people of immediate gratification. Technology, of course, has a lot to do with this. For better or for worse, most of us have come to depend on our smartphones or computers for nearly everything. And this technology is designed by its nature to eliminate waiting. You want to know what's going on in the world? We have an app for that. You want to buy something right now? Amazon will have it on your doorstep tomorrow. You want music? Streaming services put the world's library of music at our fingertips. You want food? Grubhub can deliver within an hour. The list goes on and on. Indeed, we've become so accustomed to having our needs met instantly that we quickly become irritated when things go awry. You know the feeling when the Wi-Fi goes down, when our phone freezes up, or when that dreaded multicolored <coughs> pinwheel appears on the screen of our computer. Our love affair with technology has utterly compromised our ability to wait. The late Henry Nouwen, Dutch priest and theologian who lived and taught in the United States until he died, was a very astute observer of American culture. He wrote this, quote, Waiting is not very popular in this country. In fact, most people consider waiting to be a waste of time. The culture says, get going, do something, don't just sit there and wait. For many people, waiting is the awful desert between where they are and where they want to be. End quote. Now, there are virtues, of course, to a can-do attitude. There is a time for action, for social engagement, for getting things done. But there is also a time for being quiet, listening carefully, watching attentively. For if we are to be a spirit-led people, if our actions are to be purposeful and in keeping with God's will, we must first learn the art of prayerfully waiting for direction so that we know where we are going. The wisdom of waiting is that it reminds us that we are not in control after all, that we are in fact dependent upon something bigger than ourselves for our very being and for our ultimate flourishing. Now to wait on God, I hasten to add, is not merely to bide our time. Holy waiting is intentional and expectant. It's not just idle sitting. Holy waiting is mindful, not mindless. And this is because holy waiting is grounded in hope. To be a faithful person is to trust in God's promises for the future and to be anchored by them in our waiting. And if you're looking for a biblical example from the season of Advent for this kind of holy waiting, think of Mary and Elizabeth. The scene of the visitation is one of my very favorites where these two faithful women, one expecting Jesus, one expecting John the Baptist, visit one another with new life stirring in their wombs, each giving comfort to the other as they expectantly await for these holy infants to emerge, wondering who they will be and what God has in store for them. This is a holy waiting precisely because these women trust that God is at work in them and that the future is in God's Hands. By contrast, consider what some people regard as a great piece of postmodern literature, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. As Beckett sees it, humanity is waiting for Godot 
God to come and save them, but he never shows up. The characters in the play are told to wait for Godot, for he might come tomorrow or any minute, and so they continue to wait in their dreary existence. The only prop in the play is a dead tree. The implication in all this is that there is no God, no Savior. Life, according to Beckett, is absurd. Beckett's waiting is an ultimately empty exercise in despair and futility. It is mere biding of time. Now, I can't stand up here and disprove to you Beckett's point of view, but I can say that his absurdist world is utterly contrary to my personal experience and certainly contrary to the experience of God's people as revealed in our sacred texts. Beckett blithely ignores all the ways in which God has already come into our lives. God has come in the mystery of creation itself, for one thing. God has come in the giving of the law, which allows us to live moral lives anchored in meaning and purpose. God has come in the prophetic voices of those who have gone before us and who are constantly calling us back to God's ways of justice and truth. And God, most importantly, has come in the person of Jesus Christ, whose life reveals unmistakably how self-sacrificial love can change us completely and turn a mean world into a beautiful one. The truth is that God is always and everywhere coming into our lives if we only open our hearts to his presence. In some, and contrary, with all respect to Beckett, God's people wait not in despair, but in hope, because there is every reason to trust in God's promise that he will indeed come again and again and again. One last thing I want to say about holy waiting, and here too this is contrary to Beckett, is that it is not something we do alone. It is rather something we do together as the mysterious body of Christ on earth. Let me quote Henry Nouwen once more. The whole meaning of Christian community lies in offering a space in which we wait for that which we have already seen. Christian community is the place where we keep the flame alive among us and take it seriously so that it can grow and become stronger in us. In this way, we can live with courage, trusting that there is a spiritual power in us that allows us to live in this world without being seduced constantly by despair, lostness, and darkness. That is how we dare to say that God is a God of love, even when we see hatred all around us. That is why we can claim God is a God of life, even when we see death and destruction and agony all around us. We say it together. We are it together. We affirm it in one another. Waiting together, nurturing what has already begun, expecting its fulfillment. That, after all, is the meaning of marriage, friendship, community, and the entirety of Christian life. End quote. What Advent teaches us, in short, is that we are a people who wait. We wait patiently, alertly, and faithfully, trusting in the vision of the coming kingdom that Christ promises, and that Isaiah before him described with such eloquence in our first lesson. Let it be known, Isaiah says, that in the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of mountains, and all the nations shall stream to it. And on this mountain, God will insist that the peoples beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
that nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. That is a vision worth waiting for. That is a vision worth working for. May God in his own time make it so, and may he use us to be instruments of this wonderful peace. Amen.